Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. And to find out more and perhaps support our efforts, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. I'll go into more details about that at the very end. My guest today is Panash Desai. Panash is a contemporary thought leader whose message of love and self-acceptance has drawn thousands of people from around the world to his seminars and workshops. He is on the faculty of the Omega Institute and the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health. <clears throat> so welcome, Panash. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here with you. Yeah. I first became aware of you, as did many people, when you were on Oprah's Super Soul Sunday show. Uh, and I'll tell you my first impression. My first impression was, okay, this guy was born at quite a high level of consciousness. People come in at different levels. And he was probably born into a very spiritual family. And uh, he has a good heart, brilliant mind. Now, the question is, uh, how effective can he be in enabling others to awaken or rise to a higher level of awareness? Because some teachers are really just good at describing their own experience, and the audience sits there patiently and listens and gets inspired and goes home and doesn't really you know, have any permanent effect from it. And other teachers are able to somehow um, bring about some kind of shift in their listeners or, or students' awareness. Um, so, my estimation or opinion is, you know, worth a pile of salt, but um, I, I, I feel in reading your book and listening to a, a number of recordings and so on, um, that in most respects you, you score pretty highly on that second part, you know? And at the same time, I bet you even you feel that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, that um, you know you would like to be even more effective than you are, and that sometimes there is a gulf between what you're saying and what people are hearing, and, and what kind of a benefit or effect they get. What do you say? Well, I think that you know when you're sharing a message like this, especially when there's an energetic undertone to it that really is a catalytic kind of a, an agent, there is always going to be a distance between what's expressed and what's heard, uh -huh. and sometimes you're ahead of your time. Sometimes you're actually laying a foundation for something that will be evidence three to five hundred years from now. Mm. And so I'm clear that more than the words, it's about the presence. And it's about having the courage to embody who I'm here to be, my soul signature. And that somehow in some incredible way that has nothing to do with me, it reminds people that they are that as well. Yeah, no, that's good. Um... And a lot of teachers say, and a lot of people experience, that when they go, uh, when they associate themselves in one way or another with, with a teacher, that it's not so much the words that are spoken, it's the resonance or the presence or the transmission that is ha hopefully having an effect. Yeah, but you know, it, it's funny because um, for me, all of this was very strange. And um, even to this day, it's very strange. Um, I was, uh, as you shared, born in a state of awareness that uh, everyone's trying to attain or everyone's trying to move into, yet for me, it's absolutely normal. And um, of course, being Indian, we have this 5,000 year old tradition where these states of consciousness and these states of awareness have been demonstrated over and over again. And also being Indian, you know, there's a very clear understanding that it's not about information, it's not about teachings, it's not about the words necessarily, but it's actually more about the presence or the energy or the actual vibrational signature of that individual. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, people will days, thousands and thousands of miles to take the whole family just to be in the presence of someone who has had this experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're very right in saying that, you know, there's definitely a difference because you can go to those lectures and seminars and just hear somebody's um, mental extrapolation of what it is to be enlightened. However, when you're in the presence of someone who's actually been there and felt that, and embodies that, it's catalytic naturally in its effect. And ultimately, you know, what, what's being expressed through me is going to become normal. It's just that right now, people have moved so far away from their essential nature that it has an impact. My, my overarching objective is to become completely ineffective <laughs> <laughs> and to retire. So, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best that I can to retire myself and to become ineffective in as, in as short a time as possible. I have a feeling you won't be retiring in this lifetime. Well, my, my hope is that that happens. Huh. My, hope, my hope is that 
we use the same mediums that we have right now that are propagating the fear and the separation to start to propagate the love and the oneness that we all know we, we really embody and share together. And that if we can actually start to do that in a way that isn't obvious and in a way that isn't even spiritual, but in a way that's very mainstream and accessible, we can very quickly start to activate that same evolutionary impulse in millions of people without them even knowing. And so. Yeah, and that does seem to be happening. Um, I mean, if you compare what's going on right now with what was happening in the 50s or even the 60s, uh, it's a you know, night and day difference. There's just such a, such a flood of, of uh, interest and information and so on in what we're talking about here and what we're going to be talking about today that there's no comparison whatsoever. So it does seem there's some kind of epidemic going on in a good sense. There is, you know, it's, um, it's a, a wonderful time of flowering. And yet, you know, when you look at it, when you look at the news headlines, it just seems like the world's in a rapid state of decay. <laughs> but actually what's collapsing is all of the structures and systems that don't support who we naturally are. What's collapsing is all the, is the based agenda that has in some way led to the mechanization of human beings to the point where they can't be intuitive and they can't feel their emotions anymore. And so the good news is that that's falling away so that now we can come back to our intuition, come back to being human and realize that that's really the blessing, that there's something miraculous that happens when we can fully be ourselves. Yeah, I think we're going to talk about this quite a bit in this interview. And, and in a moment, I want to loop back and talk more about your personal story. But this this idea of collapsing, um, it's something that I've been thinking about for, for decades and I have been anticipating, as have many people who are sort of, you know, interested in spirituality. Um, in fact, I remember back in the 70s, I read this interesting book called Prophecies and Predictions, Everyone's Guide to the Coming Changes by a lady named Moira Timms. And she, she kind of, uh, she took ancient prophecies from all the different traditions and correlated them with what has actually been happening in the world up until that point, and then kind of extrapolated in terms of what might we, can, we might be able to expect in the coming decades. And uh, so a lot of people, you know, in a spiritual mode have been expecting some big change. And of course, there was the whole 2012 thing. Uh, but as you say, you know, if you look at the headlines, it doesn't seem like things are getting better. It seems like things are getting worse. And yet, uh, can you give an interpretation of those headlines that would actually um, increase people's optimism that change of a good sort is actually coming? Yeah. So typically when we start evolving vibrationally, the first thing that comes up is everything that we've repressed or suppressed or denied. So on an individual level, um, when people come into contact with me or they start doing this work, the first thing they experience is their vibrational density, which is their accumulated emotional content. See, so when sadness over time isn't expressed, it becomes depression. When anger over time isn't expressed, it becomes rage. And fear just becomes unmanageable and unworkable. Now, when you look at that on a global level, what keeps the, the disparity in place is the fear. You know, as much as we think we're free, your average human being exists inside their comfort zone, not realizing that their comfort zone is actually nothing more than a mental prison. And what keeps that mental prison in place is the fear that they haven't felt or experienced. And so what's happening right now is that all of these structures and systems on a global level that operate under the energy of fear are actually being challenged. And that's why now it looks like everything's getting worse. It actually isn't. It's just that all of the repressed or suppressed energy and all of the all of the stuff that we haven't wanted to deal with as a species is being brought to the light of conscious awareness. And of course, now the way mainstream media is, and even more so the mainstream media, the way the internet allows us to have a real glimpse of what's really true and what's really playing out is allowing us to have a, 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 an objective view of this awakening and this acceleration. And so I know that when you look at the headlines, it's one disease after another, it's one catastrophe after another, it's one uh, potential threat of war after another. However, when you look at it from a holistic perspective where you're able to step back from it a little bit, you can just see that this is nothing more than this immature species maturing. That that's really all it is. It's just a very immature species that's maturing. We're, we're growing up, we're getting over this stuff that that separates us and we're beginning to realize that we're interconnected. And so, and, and sometimes those growing pains um, are intense and sometimes those growing pains are smooth. 
but nonetheless, you know, we're, we're talking about you know, a maturation of a species. You know, we're maturing, our entire planet's maturing, individuals are maturing, and also the illusion, this illusion, these these concepts that we're sold of enlightenment and happiness and success and all of these things that are constantly, you know, drummed into us are beginning to be exposed for the lie that they are. Mm. That actually all of these external markers are nothing more than lies that perpetuate this imprisonment. And so it's actually very exciting. When, when you see a headline that's actually catastrophic, by all means feel what there is to feel inside of you, but know that that headline is showing up because you're waking up. Hmm. Not on you, but the world. Exactly. Yeah. I interviewed Barbara Marks Hubbard about a month ago, and she's fond of using the uh, example of a caterpillar metamorphizing into a butterfly. And, you know, when the caterpillar starts to undergo that change, it's a very serious situation. He begins to dissolve, you know, and yeah. ends up turning into a bunch of mush. And then in that mush, there are these uh, imaginal cells that begin to form and take the structure of a butterfly. Uh, so I guess the question would be, and I don't know if you or anyone can answer this, to what extent is are the structures that, we, that seem so um, well-established in society going to dissolve and crumble? For instance, can, can we expect the entire economy to collapse? Can we, can we expect uh, various modes of uh, food production and transportation and so on to come to a halt um, in order for uh, you know, a really thorough transformation to occur? We're alive at a time where what's required is conscious non-participation. So the only reason why a very small percentage, let's say maybe a handful of people run the entire government, run the entire global agenda, is because we let them. Hmm. Just imagine right now if everyone who's watching this actually started loving and accepting themselves, which is the most revolutionary act that any human being could commit within their lifetime. And we actually started to opt out of all of the, the needs that are constantly drummed into us that we have to meet and live up to. You know, whether it be the need to be successful, the need to have money, the need to be recognized, right? All of these false needs. And we could actually come back to a state of being naturally who we are. We'd naturally opt out of, of most of what, you know, this, this manipulation is, is wanting us to be a part of. And so there's absolutely a revolution occurring. And it's an internal revolution. See, people are a little too, too awake and a little too aware right now. And they're beginning to see through you know, what's going on. They're beginning to recognize that, you know, world leaders are interchangeable pawns, that it doesn't matter who you elect, that there's a greater agenda that they're working towards that has nothing to do with the people that they represent. Mm -hmm. In that same way, people are beginning to realize that corporate entities have far too much power and they're beginning to exert a little too much control over the way governments function. And so, you know, we're, we're alive at an amazing time. And um, this is absolutely about a revolution. But it's going to be a silent, conscious revolution. It's going to be an internal revolution. And the more we embrace the parts of us that we've rejected, or the parts of us that we've been told that we have to fix, heal, change, and improve, the faster this external world begins to come into alignment with that greater reality. Yeah. I mean, you know, you drive a car and you fly on planes, so you're using gasoline and oil and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And, you know, there may come a time when gasoline and, and oil are, you know, antiquated. They, they might seem like the steam engine or, <laughs> uh, and, you know, you, we're, you, you, you may send your daughters to school in Florida and, and put them in, in the educational system there, but there may seem, uh, they may, there may come a time when that educational system would seem very primitive by comparison mm -hmm. to what we actually end up having. So I guess the question here is, you know, we're part of the system, that we're, we're very much in, enmeshed, engulfed in, in a culture that has certain ingrained ways of doing things. And to a certain mm -hmm. extent, we need, to, we need to participate in those things, even though ultimately we may not believe in them, unless we want to just go out and live on a farm and, you know, <laughs> try to be off the grid or something, which, which mm -hmm. most people don't do. So, is that hypocritical and and can we go ahead and respond well well i think that you know you can't you can't stand outside of it and throw stones at it that's the first thing um you have to you have to evolve inside of it and somehow evolving inside of it transforms it hmm. and so here's the good news there are a lot of major ceos right now that are coming out of the closet as meditators hmm. and they're beginning to now let the world know that the reason why they're successful is because they meditate 
Yeah. And some of them are even, you know, as bold as to say that that's the sole reason why they're successful. Yeah. Now, I've never heard that before. And, and the fact that now people are coming out and saying that in the media now provides people a new blueprint for what it means to be successful. And even it, it, it evolves the whole word success into a whole other boundary, a whole other stratosphere of fulfillment. And so, you know, do we participate in the existing system? Yes, but we evolve inside of it to the point where we make it extinct. See, we, we can't opt out of life and be effective. You know, I was just um, with, with Oprah, actually, at the Life You Want tour in New Jersey. And there was one thing that she said that really struck me. She said, she said if I didn't have all of this money, you wouldn't listen to me. Right. She said, if I, if I wasn't as successful as I am, why would you listen to me? And so, by all means, we have to participate, understanding it's an illusion. And we have to participate at the highest level because that's the only way it's going to shift. That's how we have a voice. That's how we have the reach. That's how we have the impact. So it's not hyper, it's not um, hypocritical. It's not hypocritical. Right. It's just paradoxical. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the nature of duality. You know, it's just, it's just paradoxical. Yeah. My favorite word, by the way. And I, I didn't really mean to say you're hypocritical or anything. I'm just no, uh, no. playing devil's advocate a little bit. Um, no, but that's for, that's for everyone because I know we all feel, everyone who's watching this to a certain degree feels like, Okay, maybe I could be doing more or, mm -hmm. you know, I, I fundamentally understand that the systems I'm participating in are flawed. You know, maybe I should opt out and move to a farm. So we all have that inner angst. So I just wanted to clarify that for all of you, yeah. that how it changes is by you playing it from an awakened state. How, yeah. how it changes is, is by you playing the game from a heightened level of consciousness. Is that what you meant when you said we have to participate at the highest level? Yes. So we might be a actor or a politician or a bus driver or whatever but uh if we're doing that from a heightened level of consciousness then yes. we're, we're having a totally different effect than we than uh, than we would otherwise that's what you're saying you're absolutely changing everything because you embodying that state you're impacting everything and everyone around you you know our, our job really is the excuse to which we get to love people yeah. or the divine gets to love its creation <laughs> and so ju just imagine being a bus driver and just imagine being at peace with yourself yeah and, and being able to then impact all of the people that are on that bus and then being able to impact in you know, all the towns and cities that you drive through on a regular basis. It's not about the stature or the status of your life. It's about the degree to which you're connected while you're in the midst of even the most mundane activities. Mm. Is that what you mean by soul signature? You have a book here, Discovering Your Soul Signature. So is your, would your soul signature be the sort of, well, you, you explain what you mean by it. Your soul signature is your divine essence. Uh -huh. It's who you really are. It's your most authentic self. And it's the part of us that actually has been conditioned out of us, you know, predominantly. And so that's why, you know, the journey is one of remembering it and discovering it again and aligning with it. You see, who we naturally are is abundant. We're loved, we're healthy, we're vital, and we're connected. Dare I say it, we're divine. Who we are normally is basically, as we show up, as our conditioned selves or our self-image. And so it's important now that we begin to embrace the self-image, embrace the conditioning, embrace everything that's there on the level of our humanity, understanding that that's the doorway to our divinity. So really enlightenment is nothing more than being profoundly human. <laughs> you're gonna be neurotic, you're just gonna be peacefully neurotic. I don't know. I would, there, here, okay, here's a little devil's advocate on that one. Okay. I, I, would, I would agree and disagree uh, because I think maybe initially you could be peacefully neurotic, but I think eventually, at least hopefully eventually, yes. uh, that divine essence bleeds into your personality and, and kind of purges or heals or resolves your, your neuroses. And, and you, you're not always like a screwed up, enlightened person. You eventually become kind of you know, nicely integrated and coherent on all levels. Well, I guess another way to describe it is that, you know, when you stop having a problem with you at that point, your soul naturally emanates through you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a certain version of oneness that's conformity and all of a sudden egos are going to disappear and people are going to be walking around like zombies drooling down one side of their face. That's just not sexy. That is not our eventual destiny. We're here to express oneness uniquely. And our ego is our ally in that. It's just that we don't understand its function. You know, we're so quick to get rid of our ego, we don't realize that in the absence of our ego, we'd be missing the point. Now, 
an integrated ego. Now, that's interesting because when you can embrace your identity and you can embrace your neuroses and you can embrace all that you are, there's freedom in that. That's really where the freedom arises from. And so, you know, that that's the clarification is that, you know, we're not going to stop being who we are. We're just going to stop having a problem being who we are. Mm. And then our soul shines through us in a tangible way that's evidenced by the impact that it has on the people around us. Yeah. Um, I interviewed Shinzen Young a few, I don't know, a couple months ago. He's a Buddhist teacher. And, and he was saying that in, in, in Buddhism, there are certain groups in Buddhism that he feels are rather zombie-like in their behavior, that somehow the, mm. the, the nature of their spiritual practice has made them kind of unnatural. And, mm. and then he mentioned other aspects of Buddhism or other branches of it in which people are much more spontaneous and lively and, and natural. So it, it would seem that there, you know, in some cases are spiritual practices uh, or approaches which suppress your naturalness rather than embrace it and, and, and enliven it. Yeah, the, the, you know, that zombie-like state of, of um, absolute communion really isn't the objective here. Um, I, I describe it like there's a house, you know, it has three floors. Mm -hmm. And the first floor is a personality, which is where you're completely your personality. The second floor is a blending of the personality and the soul. And the third floor is completely sold. There's no personality present. Right. The optimal state is that middle floor mm. because that's the place from which you can bring all your soulful qualities into the human experience. If you were to, so right now, if I were to go into that completely expanded state, I'd be unrelatable and everyone would be looking at this going, well, that's all well and good, but why do I want to live in a non-functioning state? And that's not it. It's not a non-functioning state. It's actually a completely integrated state where you can function, but you're bringing that quality of your soul signature into everything that you do. Nice. That's there's, the statement. There's a Sanskrit phrase. I forget the Sanskrit, but the English of it is the, uh, the lamp at the door. That you you mm. you kind of uh, live at that junction point uh, of the doorway between the the absolute mm. and the relative, and and incorporate both in your awareness and experience. And I think the Eastern world, you know, has a lot to do with the cultivation of that zombie-like state because, quite honestly, there's a there's a belief system and a structure that supports that. You know, if I was in India and I was in that state, people would clothe me and feed me and, you know, bathe me and, you know, occasionally, you know, show me a Bollywood movie or something. You know, they'd, they'd take care of me. But if I was in that state in the West, they'd probably put me in that mental asylum and, uh, and think, what the hell's wrong with him? You know? Because because in the Eastern world, no self is a blessing, and in the Western world, no self is an abomination. Yeah, there have been some great saints, though. You must admit, like Ananda Maima or Neem Karoli Baba, who were not very functional. Even Ramana Maharshi, not terribly functional in terms of you know, they, they might have had a hard time running a business, uh, but they were just had a profound impact on on a lot of people, and just that was the role they had to play. You know? Yeah, they were they were anchor points, you know, at a particular point in time and space to evidence to humanity what was possible for them. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's not the absolute goal of where we're headed. They were just these wonderful hub stations of possibility and presence. And that was a magnificent time, you know, the, the, at, at that particular juncture in human history, there were so many beings who were embodying this state of just absolute divine connection. You know, Nityananda was another one. Yeah. You know, there were so many incredible beings around at that time. And I just felt like it was a, a conspiracy that happened that all these incredible, incredible beings decided to come down and evidence the highest form so that we have a blueprint, at least of what that is and what it feels like to be around that. Yeah, and they were also um, generators. I mean, look at the impact that uh, rippling over generations that each of them had, uh, you know, each of them had disciples who had disciples and so on. So they each kind of created this wave of awakening and perhaps, uh, you know, more effectively than if they'd been scurrying around doing, you know, some relative task. They, all they had to sit, all they had to do was sit and be and it sent out waves of, of influence mm -hmm. uh, over, you know, time. And, you know, Rick, I have to tell you, even today, it's, a, it's, it's somewhat of a challenge for me because there are days where I'm just in that state of just, I mean, staring out of my window, just in awe <laughs> and uh, not really wanting to get, because you see, you're not driven by the same social drivers as everyone else. Yeah. You see, you get to a certain point where it, it's kind of this dance between nothing really matters mm -hmm. and everything matters. Yes. 
And there are days where it's like nothing matters and I'm just in that vibrational state of just communion with everything and there's nothing else. And there are other days where I have daughters that have, a, have kept me engaged in the world because I have a certain level of attachment now to the world and the outcome of the world. But in the absence of them, you know, I wouldn't have had that. It's funny that in the absence of my daughters, there was really nothing keeping me tied to the human experience in me. So it's, it's funny how now I fluctuate between nothing really matters and everything matters. Do you fluctuate alternately or do you uh, live both at the same time sometimes? Well, it's kind of spontaneous actually. It's like this seamless ebbing and flowing between these different states of experience. And um, for the most part now, what I'm discovering is that this, this more nothing really matters kind of beingness that's all encompassing is the dominant experience. It's really the, the, the dominant part. And then, you know, I'm still 36. There's still some immature aspects of my personality that I have to embrace and still some fearful aspects of myself that I have yet to fully integrate. So there's that, you know, so, so it's all of it, you know, there's not, that's why I think that, you know, the more, the more expansive or inclusive we make enlightenment, the better, because, um, otherwise, you know, we've got this too narrow a definition of what it is and people are constantly striving towards some goal or ideal that they're never going to obtain. You know, it used to, it used to drive me nuts. I had a Buddhist, uh, monk friend and, you know, the, the Buddhists love talking about the middle path, right? It's their favorite teaching is this middle path and, and, uh, I just said, you know, this middle path thing is just giving me a headache. Like, you know, it just feels like it's too narrow. You know, explain it to me, you know. And so he starts roaring out loud and whacks me on my back. And, you know, he's a very chubby monk and he's a very sweet guy. He kind of looked like that, um, the chubby happy Buddha that you have with his hands up in the air that you, you know, the right. abundance Buddha. Yeah. And so he's like, whack me his back, having a good laugh, right? Laughing at me, he laughs, laughing for five minutes and he finally stopped. And he just said, make the middle path so good that you can never fall off. That's nice. And I'm like, okay, so that's cool. So that means become so inclusive of who you are and life that it's all a part of your being. I love that point. Yeah. I love that point. Yeah. I think you mentioned that in your book too. Yeah. Uh, as you're speaking, I, I was reminded of a Nisarga Data quote, which I just looked up. He, he said, uh, wisdom is knowing I am nothing. Love mm. is knowing I am everything. And between the two, my life moves. Yeah. Kind of That's room. beautiful. Just, just what I you love saying. Yeah. yeah. He, he delivered the same lecture for 20 years, right? And hoped <laughs> that somebody would finally hear what he had to say. Yeah. It's another great one. Huh. But I think what you're saying is really important um, because it seems to me there's a natural human tendency to cubbyhole ourselves, you know, to sort of isolate ourselves in a particular belief or a particular mm -hmm. religion or a particular. You know, I mean, there's these days there's non-dual people around who sort of take a, a stand in the in the non-dual perspective, or at least the understanding of it, to the exclusion of the dual. And when you start talking about relative things, they think you're just playing around with, uh, you know, distractions and, and illusions. Um, but what you're saying is this all-inclusive, all-engulfing, all-encompassing awareness, which harmonizes and contains all the all possible paradoxes and therefore is unperturbable that's exactly right yeah great um let's uh let's loop back a bit because you've alluded to your birth and your upbringing and and so on and um i think you have a very interesting story and and if i don't get you to tell it there are people going who are going to email me and say, why didn't you get them to tell his story? I always like to hear the blow by blow description of, you know, how they came to be who they are. So let's start at the beginning and maybe I'll throw in a few questions as you go along. Well, um, I was born into an Indian family in London uh, in 1978. And um, my parents, before they had me, had, had a stillborn baby girl. And so being Indian, uh, we had encountered living saints uh, for multiple generations. And um, at the loss of this child, uh, when my mother was three months pregnant with me, she went to India to be blessed by one of these beings um, for my birth. Who was that? Do you mind uh, saying? Well, she went to Ganeshpuri to see Nit uh, to Nityananda's shrine, and, uh, and Muktananda, Muktananda was there at the time. Yeah. Okay. And so um, Muktananda said, uh, basically, he's coming to do God's work, and um, you know, don't worry. You know, and um, so I was born, and. Uh, I was born into a house that had a meditation room in the living room. 
and um, we were a first generation immigrant family so we had like 14 people living in one house and uh, and so having a meditation room in one of the rooms was a big deal and actually the room that my grandfather put the meditation room in was the living room where everyone was ordinarily watch tv and goof off so all of a sudden there's a meditation center there and um, i spent the first five years of my life uh, with my grandmother in that room and uh, she would recite mantras and chant the Guru Gita every day and I was, she was a, a very devotional woman and um, I'll never forget she always had this aroma of like coconut oil it's like you know it, 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 it just would make you hungry it's like it's such a good smell and uh, even when I smell that smell I think of her and um, you know it, my house was like an ashram like there was incense everywhere and just you know you, you can imagine and um, so I was exposed to this devotional tradition at a very early age and um, actually, when I, even as a child, when I would get upset, I was having a hard time. As soon as I crossed the threshold of that meditation room, I would stop and just be at absolute peace. And so that vibrational space was home for me, one of devotion, one where everyone's focus was on the divine and um, everyone's uh, heart was open to something greater. And um, being Indian, we also understand that God is infinite. So. I grew up with pictures of everybody, like Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and every every great saint and mystic you can imagine was on my wall. And so I, I was every religion. I was every religion. Hindus and, tend uh, to be that way. They tend yeah. to be very inclusive. Yeah, well, well we, you know, we cover all of our bases. Yeah. <laughs> that way, you know, when you transition, someone's going to be there to meet you. Yeah, right. You can't go wrong. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so if you're going to have a relationship with the divine, have an infinite relationship with the divine. Yeah. It also works out great, Rick, for school holidays. I was every religion. That's true. So that was fantastic, too. <laughs> I got presents for every holiday. Yeah. And um, so that was my life. And, um, you know, it's a, a very interesting life because, you know, when you're Indian, again, on the weekends, you watch Bollywood movies and you go see spiritual teachers. It's just kind of what you do, right? Mm -hmm. And um, London had a, a big uh, Indian community. And so a lot of the saints and rishis from all traditions would come there and do programs. And um, the weird thing is that they would all say to me, we've been waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And I would just look at them like they were strange. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been an ongoing theme through my through my early childhood, you know, all the way even into my teens. And um, so, just out of the blue, your your mother would take you up to the saint, and he'd say, "Oh, yeah. we've been waiting for you." Kind of like the Dalai Lama or something, you know. Yeah, you know, one of the things you do at the end of a program is you have this thing called darshan, which right. is basically you go and you know get the blessing of the of the saint or the realized master, and um, you know, so we'd wait for an hour or two for darshan and get there and then they say, oh, you know, we've been waiting for you, you know, when you're older, come see me in my ashram. Uh -huh. yeah. So, thank, and they'd also, they'd also say thank you for incarnating, which uh -huh. I found very strange as a child. Okay, um, now, did you, do you have any idea, or did any of them say, or do you now have any idea, who in the heck you were that is this big special guy that's, that's, <laughs> that's come to earth? I mean, do you have any sense of, you know, past lives or what sort of entity you may have been and incarnated as? You know, that's a that's a great question. And it's a question that I um, won't answer on purpose. But you do have some uh, something, but you know, you don't want to say publicly. No, because I think because I think ultimately, it's not about me. And it's not about me being the reincarnation of somebody or um, it's not about that. It's okay. it's just it's about it's about being here, embodying this presence at this time, you know, there, there are so many people and Benjamin Krem was running around with a, with a whole, um, you know, prophecy about the Maitreya being born in London. I yeah. get that all the time. <laughs> um, you yeah. know, other people experience Christ, other people experience Krishna. I mean, it just, it's so funny how it's, you know, I call it, um, it's a game of pin the avatar on panache. Right? <laughs> and everyone's been trying to do it my whole life. It's like, uh -huh. well, who is this guy? Right. And, and based on their belief system and ideology, you know, they'll try and pin the avatar on. Yeah. And, um, and ultimately, you know, all I can say is that, you know, um, there is an unbroken lineage. Uh, this unbroken lineage is here to support humanity. And what I can say is that I'm definitely a part of that unbroken lineage. So without mentioning specifically whom you might have been in previous lives or anything, would you say that you're an avatar? 
I wouldn't say that, but I would. People say that about me. Okay, and let's define what an avatar is, just to put it in context. A avatar is like a an avatar is an incarnation of a of a divine being. So, right. for example, you can have an avatar. You can have an incarnation of Krishna or Shiva. Um, you can have an avatar of a particular consciousness that that comes into human form to just help remind humanity, you know, about what their potential is. So that word gets used around me a lot. You know? Yeah. And there are partial avatars and more complete avatars and full yeah. avatars and all also degrees. I suppose we could almost say that in a sense, we're all avatars because we all have that spark That's of the right. divine, right? That's right. And plus also the other thing is that the reason why I don't make a big deal about all of that is that there is no hierarchy and that in oneness, everybody is that. Yeah. And really, that's the point now. You know, it's not about an individual coming back to save humanity. It's about all of us embodying who we are and doing it collectively. So the the age of the guru and the teacher is basically over. And this is a this is an age of personal empowerment. And um, really, that's the only way it can happen. And so again, people will be here to remind us of who we are. But for the most part, it, this is about us waking up to ourselves. Yeah, there's a saying you've probably heard it: the next Buddha is the Sangha. That's right. I heard that one. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I must say, I, I've derived a lot of benefit from association with a couple of gurus. In fact, you see a picture of one behind me there. And uh, so it's not over for me in terms of the benefit I derive from, you know, visiting uh, Ama in this case. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and well, there, there are many, many people in the world who, who gain yeah. a lot from seeing teachers. So I wouldn't want to put that down. No, 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 stop putting it down. It's just that, um, you see, there's an, as long as there's a need, uh -huh. those incarnations will occur. Uh -huh. We're coming at a point in our development as a species where there will no longer be that need. That's what I mean. Don't you think that there will always be some lights that are brighter than others? Some people who are more, you know, who exude more uh, Shakti, more spiritual energy than others and whose no, association with whom would be beneficial? No, we're moving into a point where everyone's um, everyone's light and everyone's contribution is being leveled out. So what's happening right now is a great harmonizing and balancing. And whereas before you would need individuals who had gone through, you know, uh, all kinds of interesting incarnations to be able to embody this type of consciousness, we're moving to a point where people won't need to be reminded anymore because they'll have remembered. Yeah. So, so what you're saying is enlightenment or whatever we want to call it will become more the norm and, and it won't be a big deal. If, exactly. If, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, there are still, still lots of incredible beings alive that I respect and admire deeply. Mm -hmm. However, that, that promise or that possibility will be actualized. Making the function, making the role and the function redundant. Yeah. I, just, I still suspect there are always going to, there's always going to be a range, you know? I mean, it's natural that, that, you know, there's a range of levels of evolution. People are born at varying levels of evolution and they continue to progress. So I can't imagine, maybe well, my imagination a... is limited, but I can't imagine that they, they will necessarily have a world where everybody is at the same level of, of, of enlightenment. Uh, that, that's where we're headed. You think so? Yeah, because, because you see, here's the funny thing. We all came from that level of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And we're all experiencing that to the degree to which we can right now. However, what's happening is that everyone's being accelerated through their evolution. So humanity's next evolutionary leap is spiritual. Sure. And so right now we're being accelerated through that evolutionary leap. Literally to the point where we become luminous. We become what? So luminous. Luminous, luminous. So what that means is that your inner light will become so powerful that it will be evidenced through your physical form. Mm -hmm. Just like those medieval depictions of, you know, saints where they drew those halos around them. You know, that's really going to happen. We're moving in that direction. Yeah. And again, it might not be immediately, but within three, three lifetimes, I guess, three generations, mm -hmm. we'll be in that state. And so, you know, you, you, need a, you need a teacher as long as you need teaching. But the very second... You realize that there's nothing to learn anymore. You don't need a teacher. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not grateful for all of the teachers that have come. Of course we are, because they've played their part in us evolving beyond the need. See, humanity's on the verge for the first time of realizing that there is no need for anything external. That's where we're moving to. Right. And that, cannot, that shift cannot occur as long as there is any dependency on anyone or anything. 
Well, okay. Is, <laughs> when a baby is born, right? Yes. A baby is utterly dependent upon its parents and mm -hmm. would, would die without them or without, mm -hmm. some, without some kind of care. And then the baby eventually grows up to the point where maybe that baby is caring for the parents. <laughs> you know, the roles have reversed. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. It would seem to me that, I don't want to beat the point to death, but it would seem to me that there, there are always going to be you know, some people who are a little bit farther along the path well, than others and, and who could inspire and help uplift the others. Maybe I can explain it this way. Mm -hmm. You see, if, if a baby was born and the baby was just left to be in its natural state, that baby wouldn't need anyone subsequently to remind it of its natural state. No, but it would need food and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So all of that stuff would still be there. But, but the spiritual need or the role will no longer be necessary because actually what's going to happen is people are going to stop messing with what is natural. Mm -hmm. So the conditioning and all of that stuff that happens is going to end to the point where when a being is born, they will be left in that state of oneness and that state of completion entirely, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's, we're a little way away from that, but that's where we're headed. We're, we're heading, you know, on, onto a, a plane of consciousness where everyone's a guru, everyone's a teacher, everyone's embodying their highest principle and their highest potential, see? And at that point, there's no hierarchy anymore. Mm. Well, that kind of brings us back to your story, actually, because you, um you know, you were born in this spiritual family and you were very attuned as a little kid. And then you kind of hit a rough patch when you were a teenager. Yeah. Uh, and so you didn't quite stay in your natural state. You kind of uh, fell from it or got kicked out of it for a little while. So tell us about that phase. Well, I, I was always in the natural state. However, just being normal was too painful, mm -hmm. right? So again, trying to conform to what everyone else was expecting of me and trying to live up to you know, what society defines as normal is just painful. And so I've gotten to a point in my life where everyone around me was doing separation as, the, as, their, as, their, as their way of being in the world. And here I am, and I couldn't buy into separation. However, there's a whole world around me that's convincing me that that's, the, that's, that's normal. And so at a certain point, when enough people tell you that pain, lack and scarcity and fear are normal, you, you, in out of some need to belong, which you have as a teenager, you, you contort yourself into a box that you don't even fit into in order to find some shred of love and acceptance from somebody outside of you. Mm -hmm. And of course it didn't work. And uh, it was just a, a very painful time because I think that, especially as teenagers, we're trying to find some sense of um, autonomy and some sense of being individualized. And, uh, and we strive for that, however, we don't have that modeled to us in a way that's holistic. Mm. We don't have it modeled to us in a way that supports our functioning as in our natural state of being, right? So for me, it was just a, a painful um, move away from, from what I had known and what I had lived in and what I'd existed in. Um, also being, a, being a, a, a young man was interesting too, because that's right around the age where people try and assert their dominance over each other. And um, I really had no interest in that hmm. uh, until eventually I had to cultivate that as a survival instinct. Hmm. But I mean, I was just like not a part of this world, um, didn't want to be a part of any of the social convention, you know, any of the norm that was going on. I basically just opted out. Um, I wasn't a part of a click or a herd mentality. That wasn't me. And so um, needless to say, I became a bit of a target. And uh, bullied and all. Yeah. So then the bullying ensued. And, you know, of course, when you're not part of a pack and you're not in this animalistic, you know, uh, mindset, uh, you get picked on. And of course, what further made that worse was I just went out with all the nice looking girls. I'd just rather, <laughs> spend, I'd rather spend my time in that vibration of love yeah. than deal with all the testosterone wars that were playing out in my school. And in my school, it was, uh, you know, very, um, pronounced because it was a you know particularly interesting neighborhood and um kind of rough you need yeah and you needed to assert yourself in that way to survive hmm. were there many other me, indian kids in your among your peers there were there were there were a few indian kids um pakistani kids uh, a lot of uh, west indian kids you know thanks to thanks to the british uh, empire hmm. uh, the commonwealth was well represented in my in my school system you know so yeah 
So you, you did, it sounds like you did capitulate a bit and go, get into a bit of a, a sex, drugs, and rock and roll phase there for a while. I did. Yeah. I loved it. It was awesome. You know, actually, in some ways, I found that whole time to be so enlightening. Funny how you, you, you wouldn't use that word with that face, but it was so essential because I understood the subtle nuances of what we as human beings do to avoid feeling our pain. And, and also the lengths that we'll go to to find some sense of love and belonging from outside of ourselves. It was a very interesting time of self-discovery for me. As, you know, and just observing myself in that. And also I got involved in music and, um, you know, and, and I was involved in the whole underground music scene, which to me was fantastic because I was, I was on stage with like thousands of people and, you know, I'm basically emceeing or rapping to music and, uh, and, you know, I'm already out there in that experience. And at the time, it didn't make any sense to me. But now when I'm on stage in front of thousands of people, it makes perfect sense to me because it's so natural to me. You know, so in, in music was a great unifier. You know, we were, we were people from all different walks of life. You had, you know, London's most wanted to aristocrats all in the same room with each other. You know, it was the great equalizer. You know, in some ways, music allowed us all to find a sense of oneness. You know, it, it kind of helped everything make sense. <laughs> but it made a world that didn't make sense make sense. And um, so I loved being a part of that. And, and the experiences that I had as a part of that were priceless for me because it really gave me an insight into just how desperate we are to be loved and accepted. And also how absolutely insane that is to expect that to come from outside of us because people don't love and accept themselves. Did you feel though kind of... Was it a period of uh, lo loss, feeling lost and confused, or and you loved it in retrospect because of the contrast, or did you really not lose your your divine awareness and and you just enjoyed the the, the yeah. play of what you were going through? Yeah, I'm I'm the kind of person where I'm just doing what I'm doing and there's nothing else that's going on, right? So so basically that was what was in front of me at the time, and that's just what I was doing. So I, I couldn't I didn't see it as a sense of loss. I saw it as a as an interesting experiment, mm -hmm. actually, um, in in belonging, not finding belonging, you know, in finding acceptance, not finding acceptance, in rejection, in abandonment, in being celebrated, in you know, in all of it, it was just an interesting um, time in my life because, again, all of these experiences allow me to relate to people, and in the absence of of not knowing what separation feels like and not knowing what abandonment feels like or rejection feels like or even adulation feels like there's no way that you can relate to other people and so um i love those sex drugs and rock and roll years they were <laughs> they were great you know i hear your daughter yeah uh, it's it's a uh, nap time so uh -huh. yeah do you mind my asking uh this could be relevant do you mind my asking what sort of drugs you experimented with well basically um most of the people that were around me were smoking marijuana and doing ecstasy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I personally wasn't really into marijuana at all. I just um, made me ecstasy. sleepy and yeah, we did a little ecstasy. Um, things that things that kind of picked you up were, were the things that I was I, I was more inclined to. Yeah, so you never the did things that, hallucinogens like LSD or anything. No, right. I mean all that. See, LSD was like your generation, uh -huh. right? So so we it was we were too cool for that. So we we, we, we didn't <laughs> well, get no, involved. No, no, we were that, too but, cool. <laughs> yeah. So so we you know we got involved in everything that was a part of rave culture, right? Um, you know, and so anything that was a part of rave culture, we would do. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Just curious, because there are a lot of there's some serious researchers who talk a lot about you know using psychedelics as a means of exploring consciousness and all. And yeah, I would I would have been curious to know what kind of experiences you had on the, on that if had you taken it, you know, given the the foundation that you already had established. Yeah, uh, no, there's no no uh, no LSD on it. That was a LSD was our parents' drug of choice. Right. So we didn't touch it. <laughs> yeah, he rebelled against it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh yeah. Oh, never mind. Enough with the drugs. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, but then you came out of that phase, and I recall you saying that in your early twenties you had a real opening, significant. Yeah. yeah. What was that? Well, actually, I realized that I realized the um, the the fragility of human existence very profoundly one night as a result of a bar fight uh, in my local neighborhood. Hmm. Um, you know, music draws all kinds of people together. Right. And um, being from East London, the majority of people that I was surrounded by were London's most wanted. Um, so it was a very dangerous environment. It wasn't necessarily somewhere where you felt safe. 
Um, in any given moment, something could happen that could literally aim your, you know, end your life or, you know, severely physically injure you for the duration of your existence. Yeah. Um, and I had been very blessed in the middle of it all, but I'd seen all of this going on. Um, but I hadn't personally experienced it. And a lot of that was to do with the, the friends that I had at the time who were very protective of me. Mm -hmm. And um, one night I ended up in a local bar by myself, actually. And um, uh, someone took exception to the fact that I was there. Um, everyone in that bar knew me. Because you were brown skinned or what? Yeah, basically. Huh. And uh, everyone in that bar knew me. And um, But none of my immediate circle was there. And so he saw it as a perfect opportunity to... Uh, uh, you know, engage in a bit of a physical altercation with me, oh. and um, he he headbutted me, and then two other people jumped in, and um, everyone realised very quickly how bad an idea that was, and uh, the bouncers came and pulled everyone off of me, and uh, I walked out, and um, you know that same night, uh, people had heard what had happened to me, and I got a phone call, and uh, basically the phone call was, would you like us to handle it? And uh, like kill, I just, kill the guy or something, uh, yeah, yeah beat him something up. like that. Yeah. And, um, and and I basically just said no. Mm -hmm. I just took it for the lesson. I, I took it for the experience and the wake up call that it was. Yeah. And I understood that I was done. Like that life and that segment of time that I had carved out for that ex for that experience was over. And um, the next day, it all ended. The music ended. The, you know, I, di I didn't go out anymore. Everything ended. The drugs ended. All of it. And I just um, got to a point where I was done. And it was so strange. Like it was like someone had tapped me on my shoulder and said, "Okay, that's enough of that. You're finished." Yeah, I know what you mean. I made a few abrupt shifts like that myself in my life. Yeah. <clears throat> and so um, then the funny thing is that what came rushing back was spirituality. Yeah. And. Um, and I just sat down with my mother and, and just uh, said, Mom, I've got to go away and live like a monk for six months. And uh, it, she knew the day was coming when that conversation was going to happen. She just didn't know it was going to happen at 21. And, um, and she said, OK, go. She said, where are you going to go, India? I said, no, not India. I want to go to America. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to an ashram upstate New York. and um, South just Walford. South Walford, but again, yeah. just lived a very simple life for six months. And I was a lousy yogi. <laughs> I mean, I, I like, like seriously, brother, I, I was so bad that I think they were going to kick me out at one point. That's how bad I was. What like, were you I, doing? It was so oh, bad. my God. Like, I'd, I'd go in the meditation room, and I, instead of sitting in a proper asana, I'd lie down, and I'd be snoring, and, you know, and it was, I was so disrespectful, you know, and, but it, it wasn't that I was meaning to be disrespectful. It's just I felt so at home in that meditation room because it reminded me of my childhood, you know, it reminded me of... Um, being with my grandmother and being in that space and um i could finally just relax and just allow all the stuff that i'd accumulated to come up and wash through me mm. you know and um so yeah that was, it was bad it was i was awful and then everyone's looking at me of course like god he's indian here he is laying there just snoring you know what chance do we stand you know so, <laughs> yeah, was, there are some very serious yogis out there right so <laughs> so it was an interesting time you know but it was uh it was an interesting six months, actually. It was a very, very powerful time of inner alchemy. And, um, you know, for, for my family, the connection wasn't really with Muktananda, it was more with Nityananda. Mm -hmm. Because my great-grandfather and Nityananda were basically friends. Mm -hmm. Nityananda would stay at my great-grandfather's house in India. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Nityananda was this realized avatar, just incredible being, probably one of the most incredible beings we've had in, in recent years. And... Um, you know, so they had a, a, a temple there with uh, his energy and his presence in. And so that's why I went there. You know, I went to reconnect with that. Yeah. I, I just want to interject that, um, you know, I think sometimes you need to lie down and snore. I mean, you, you, you know, if that's, what's, if that's what's called for in terms of some phys physiological transformation that's taking yeah. place, it can be counterproductive to force yourself to sit there and, you know, when you should be lying down and snoring. Yeah, well, you know, the very second you make it serious and you make it a part of your identity, it becomes ineffective. Mm. And so when you when you need to do it a certain way and that's the only way that you can connect, then you've got a problem. Yeah. Well, well all that means is you've upgraded, uh, you've, you've basically upgraded your prison cell. <laughs> so you've got a slightly nicer toilet, but you're still in jail. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so then you were there for six months. So, so at what point did this sort of 
profound opening take place that took well that well actually it was weird at the ashram just to digress a little bit it was mm -hmm. strange being there too brother because all of a sudden like i was i would touch people and they'd go into spontaneous kriyas and you know mm -hmm. movements of energy and they'd fall to the floor crying and i'd mm -hmm. know things about people and it was just weird and and it was particularly weird because there was a guru there and you know and all of a sudden people are like experiencing the things that they ordinarily experience from the guru from me which was weird for me hmm. and i've always been allergic to the g word you know it's like right. just don't use that around me you know and so anytime someone hits the floor and starts pranaming and says you're my guru i'm like get away from me yeah. i'm not your guru don't use that word around me and so that was interesting too because it was hard to reconcile um what was happening through me again it wasn't anything to do with me i wasn't doing it but it was just happening through me um i went back home after that and uh basically was home for a month and i just said to my mother sort of got to go back to america i said my destiny's in america hmm. and um i had a green card i mean everything i mean the, the whole the whole thing was planned out so perfectly on you know on my behalf and um, i came back to america and just traveled and wandered around for a while until I ended up in LA and um, had the experience in LA where, you know, I just experienced the divine in its totality. And uh, the rest is history from, from that moment on. And what precipitated that? I um, had reached a point where I basically was tired of that, tired of hearing about God. Mm -hmm. And I was tired of hearing about my potential. And I basically just said, listen, if I'm here to be a messenger, and all of these saints and rishis and yogis and monks and all these people that you know have seen something in me are actually seeing something that's real then i need to experience what the divine is because unless i've experienced it i can't sit there and look at people and tell them that this is the truth i'm just not going to do it so i said god if you're real show me who or what you are otherwise i'm not gonna i'm not gonna be who you know i'm here to be mm -hmm. and um needless to say when you call out god uh stuff happens uh so I'm sitting there on the sofa in Venice, California, and um, I'm experiencing wave after wave of energy moving through me, fear and sadness and anger, and basically everything that I'd accumulated over the course of my lifetime was being experienced in a very rapid way. Hmm. And uh, the culmination of that experience was just um, this light that filled the whole room, just the most incredible light. And uh, it's like the divine in its infinite form. And it was like a brilliant golden light. It's just so amazing. And uh, the feeling associated with this presence was just love, but not the human definition of the word love. So it, it cheapens it. You know, it's, so when Oprah asked me my, what my definition of God was, I could just answer it with silence because any words that we use diminish what that presence really is. Yeah. And so um, I guess when you call out God, God kind of shows up and reveals itself and... Um, from that point on, I had no choice but to embrace my soul signature and my function and my role in a conscious way. Yeah. Whereas before, prior to that, it had all been unconscious. Kind of works that way. There was a Doors song in which Jim Morrison shouted out, you cannot petition the Lord with prayer. But um, as a matter of fact, I mean, I've run into so many people who reach a point in their life where they they just sort of give God this ultimatum. You know, mm -hmm. it's like all right, I'm tired of fooling around. I want to know you. I want to see you or whatever. I'm going to sit on this rock and starve to death if you don't reveal yourself, that kind of thing. And very often, you know, if they're, if they're really ripe and ready to, to do that, very often there, there is some huge opening, some big, some big shift. So, and, you know, in that moment, it's like my whole life made sense to me. Like everything that was happening through me, my whole life, because even when I was in that, that, that music phase and that drug, sex and rock and roll phase, this energy was still translating through me to people. I mean, their lives were shifting. I mean, the conversations they would have with me were not conversations that you'd already have in a nightclub. You know, I mean, you've got grown men who people fear that are just crying you know, because they just feel the love and the energy. So in that moment, I was just, shut, it, just it all made sense to me that this energy, this presence had been flowing through me my whole life. And that's why all of a sudden people were just, bright and shiny or sparkly you know as i described them as a child right they'd, they'd go from being encumbered and heavy to being sparkly and um that's why you know all of a sudden as an adult people were having all kinds of physical ailments disappear and people were having life challenges disappear because this energy was working through me to affect those transformations talk a little bit 
more about the the fear and stuff that you experienced before that shift because I think mm. that that's also a common phenomenon where people um, it's as if you know you know when the a jet goes through the sound barrier there's all this turbulence mm. before it breaks the sound barrier and then it's smooth but it's it's uh, a lot of people report that when they kind of break through into kind of a, an awakening there's um, a real acceleration or a purging that takes place just before that. Well, the Buddha underneath the tree, he sat yeah. there and, and all the demons assailed him and so on before he finally broke through. So talk a little bit more about that. Well, the, the fear is fear is so interesting with human beings because it's like we don't allow ourselves to experience it. It's like everything in nature experiences fear, shakes it out and then moves on, right? But we as human beings don't do that. And so for me, the fear that it accumulated within me was literally shaking out of my body uh, because it's a density, because it actually gets stored in our cells. And um, the interesting thing is that it, this was evidenced in my experience, but also in so many people that come to see me because all of a sudden it's like fear keeps shaking out of them, fear starts shaking out of them, and then the tears come, mm. right? And then, so the emotion, the density, and density is important, and here's why, because our soul, it's the distance between our soul and our identity. That density is. Density. Mm -hmm. And so, and density is our anger, fear, and sadness, everything that we've repressed or suppressed or accumulated. And so what happens is, or what this energy does, is it literally brings people into experiencing their anger, their fear, and their sadness, and the distance between their soul and their identity diminishes until eventually there's no separation. Mm -hmm. And that's the complete embodiment. And that's what happened to me is that the, the anger and the fear and the sadness that, you know, I'd accumulated through being in those situations, through being in relationships, having my heart broken, through being picked on and having that rage and resentment and anger and feeling powerless and all of that inside of me, all of that was washing through me. So it was almost like I had to die or enough of me had to die in order for me to embody fully what I'm here to embody. Yeah, you just uh, touched upon like I, about three or four different Bible quotes went through my head while you were saying that. I mean, there's the body is the temple of the soul. There's mm. not pouring new wine into old wineskins. Uh, mm. There's, you know, I, I don't know if this was the Bible, but there's sort of die before you die, you know. Uh, yeah. So there's all these images or metaphors or teachings in, in, in traditionally about being a fit vehicle, you know, for the divine. And... Um, purging or cleansing or you know making the vehicle fit if it's mm. not if it's not already so and it would seem that when you're on the verge of an awakening like that there can be a final big house cleaning you know where yeah. the last dross of, of density as you put it gets gets cleaned out yeah, yeah what's what's funny is that we we do this one of our most popular events that we hold, hold here is the ultimate energy immersion and it's a 21 day program in which we specifically address density and literally what's happening no it's a remote uh, uh, class okay. yeah and and the blessing is that people come in in a sense of separation and they're leaving in a state of oneness mm -hmm. and and it's just amazing and what's happening is that it's the experience of their density and being open to feeling their feelings and feeling everything that they've stuffed inside of them that allows them to shorten the distance between you know their current reality and everything they've always wanted and so you know it's happening and um that's one of the functions of this, this presence at this time is to bring everybody into harmony with themselves. So much so that there's no distance anymore between their soul and their identity. Hmm. Because in that reality, it's like that saying, you know, with God, all things are possible. Well, God's inside of you. If you shorten the distance between you and the God within you, I mean, literally everything becomes possible. So that's what's happening. And um, the fear, the shaking out of the fear, the sadness, the anger, it's all a part of it. It's all being transmuted, I guess, for want of a better word, um, because it's people are now ready to embrace it in order to move on. Sorry for this trivial interlude, but I was reminded of Back to the Future, where Michael J. Fox is going back and he, he's trying to get his parents to meet each other. And his mother has a crush on him, which totally freaks him out. And so he's trying to, trying to get his father to say the right things to his mother so that she'll get interested in him so that he can be born. And he said, and he said here's what you need to say. You are my destiny. Yeah. And, and then he ends it up. Then the guy ends up saying, you are my density. Yeah. <laughs> he kind of screws it up. <laughs> you know, just so you know, a, a Back to the Future reference is never a trivial interlude. Okay, good. That just made the whole interview right there. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll throw in a few other ones as we go along. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> um, but okay, more serious now. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's this. I think this density word is interesting because it does seem like a very dense world. You know, um, mm -hmm. very concrete, gross, solid, and um, and that solidity, that grossness, that density uh, impinges on us constantly. And you were talking like towards the beginning of this interview about being able to in, incorporate or embody paradox and bridge two worlds. And it seems seems to me that the name of the game is to be able to function in this apparently dense, gross, solid world, and yet not have it rope you in, not have it um, overshadow you, so mm -hmm. so that the the, the non-dense can be lived in the midst of the apparent dense without any conflict or opposition. That was like a Vedic sutra. Was it? That was like, yeah, it was. It was like a Vedic sutra, Rick. That was lovely. Oh, cool. Which part? The whole thing? The, the non-dense can live in the presence of the dense without being affected by it. That was beautiful. Great. I should... Maybe next lifetime I'll be a Rishi. <laughs> You're an undercover Rishi. I like yeah, right. it. Stealth Rishi. So that's actually perfect because the more we embrace our own personal energetic uh, blueprint, the less we're impacted by the world, the less we're impacted by our reality. Hmm. And so this is why this is so important because again, what happened to me happened inside of me. It wasn't about anything outside of me. My internal state had completely shifted. And that allowed me to be a part of the world without being impacted by the world in the same way that other people were. Which means that, I mean, I could always see through this illusion, right? I always knew that it wasn't real. I always knew that there was more. I'd always known that. However, there was an inability to fully access that. Once I had addressed my own personal density, I was able to see through it. It's almost like a peek through the curtain to what this reality is really about. Mm. And, um, and at that point, then was able to be a catalyst for others. So you're absolutely right. The more you address the personal, the more you can then open up to see and interact with the universal. And so then at that point, you're not impacted by life in the same way that everyone else is. Uh, simply stated, you don't personalize things as much as you used to. Um, you have a likeness of being. You have an access to peace that's transcendent. You realize that peace is actually natural and it's always available. And that within just a few deep breaths, you can get back to that state of peacefulness, even in the midst of tragic news. Uh, you're spontaneous. You're able to feel what there is to feel as it arises. Um, you're no longer able to distract yourself. You're no longer able to um, engage in addictive patterns or behaviors. You basically step into this place of observation where you put yourself under observation and just delight in all the subtle nuances of your own humanity. And so there's a great opening that happens when people consciously address um, what they've been running away from, which is their pain. Well, what you just said is a, a really nice description of the way you function. Uh, but it's unfortunately, descriptions are not always effective prescriptions, you know. Mm. And a lot of times people hear the kind of thing you just said and try to mimic that. Uh, but somehow it doesn't have the same, it, it doesn't really mm. do it for them, you know. Let's do it. Should they're they're do kind it? of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, yeah, yeah. not getting down to the essence of it. Let's give them the experience of it. Okay, great. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, close your eyes. Okay. Just open your palms and just take some long, deep cleansing breaths. And just rest in the awareness of your breath. It's no accident that the word for breath and the word for spirit or God in most esoteric traditions is actually the same word. Just observe the inhalation and exhalation. So we're just going to ask that this greater presence that you're connected to, just make itself known to you. And feel the energy in your palms. It may be manifesting right now as a heat or almost a pins and needles sensation. Some of you may be aware of almost like an electric current. Or some of you may have yet to cultivate the courage to feel again because life has just been too traumatic and that's okay. 
Within every human being is a dormant spiritual power or potential that just needs to be remembered. And this greater spiritual power potential, again, is evidenced in every culture, every mythology, every tradition across all continents. And we're just going to ask that this spiritual power be fully remembered, realized and actualized within you. That we are vibrational beings. And that in truth, we exist inside a giant feedback loop. And that our emotions in truth are nothing more than energies in motion. Just extend the breath down to the base of the spine. And just allow this presence that is love in its purest form to come flooding in and just allow the love that has always lived within you to merge with this infinite presence. You're not broken. You don't need healing and you don't need fixing. It's time to just embrace all that you are. Because I love your anger. I love your rage. I love your sadness. I love your depression. I love your fear, your anxiety, your worry and your stress. I love everything about you that you've labeled as bad or wrong. I love your guilt and your shame. I love all that you are because no part of you is a mistake. It all serves a purpose and a function. And it all just needs to be embraced. So just rest and allow the density to flow through, knowing that the more it does, the more you're able to experience the oneness that is already here. And just be with your experience through the duration of our time together. I love you and thank you for loving me. Let me just take some breaths, uh, Rishi Rick. <laughs> some friends call me Rick Vade. Yeah, like that. <laughs> that, that works, brother. <laughs> Uh, uh, that was nice. I should always do that in the middle of interviews. And I hope, I hope this is just the middle because I want to continue on with a bit, a bit more with you if, you if we may. Only as long as you promise to make another Michael J. Fox reference. I'll work on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, or some other reference equally <laughs> insightful. Star Wars. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get to Star Wars. Yeah, some, okay. there must be some great Yoda quotes we can bring in here. Yes. <laughs> Feel the force, Luke. Exactly. <laughs> what is that? Do, there is no try. Do or don't do. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, I want to ask you about this thing of you're not broken, you don't need fixing and all that stuff. And when you say that, you know, the only way I can understand that is to kind of take it to the level of the divine. Because on that level, nothing is broken, nothing needs fixing. 
Yes. You know, but I mean, if we were to, just to take a ridiculous example, if we were to strap a parachute on you and drop you in the Syrian desert next to one of those guys who's about to decapitate some interest, some innocent person, yes. and you were to say to him, "Hey, you're cool. You're not. You're not broken. You don't need fixing." I mean, you'd probably be next in line for decapitation. There's a lot of people who, you know, have a lot of, a lot of things wrong with them, and uh, at least on a surface level. Yeah. And and so I think, see if you agree with me. I mean, when, well, when that, you, it's yeah. interesting that you chose that example actually, okay. because um, that example is a very interesting example because uh, actually this particular thing that's playing out in the media is nothing more than a manipulation, so that people can fulfil a greater objective that we will in subsequent years find out about. So that's an interesting one because. It's not what it looks like. You mean a manipulation, uh, meaning going in and bombing ISIS? That yeah, well, no, it's not even about bombing ISIS. It's about uh, a greater political agenda that's playing out. Um, that is an interesting one. But they, but these people are nothing more than pawns that are being used to bring this into the world's media. It's like it's so funny how now there's this demonization of Islam that's that's going on in the world's media, as as almost as though now Islam is the problem. Islam isn't the problem. There are so many Muslims who are so peaceful and so devoted and so committed, and there are so many esoteric branches of Islam, like Sufism, sure. that have contributed to the upliftment of humanity. And so it's like this this manipulation needs uh, an enemy, but sometimes that enemy is manufactured. Sometimes the enemy is manufactured so people can be manipulated, because when you scare people in a very tangible way, they're easier to control and manipulate. And so that's an interesting example because that's that's one that's that's a perfect example of how the media manipulates to fulfill a political objective. So what you're hearing and what you're seeing is completely um, what they want you to see and what they want you to hear. But there's something else going on beyond below the surface that actually when you start to pay attention and you start to put all the dots together, you can see a bigger picture. So that's that piece. Um, now, the second piece is, why does somebody move into a place where they can even begin to uh, commit an act like that to another person? Well, because they've moved so far away from their natural state of being. When I'm addressing you and I'm saying you're not broken and you don't need healing, you don't need fixing, when I see you, I just see this beautiful spark of golden luminosity. That's the part of you that's real. Not what you've been told. Not and not only me, but the ISIS guy who's about to everybody. Yeah, right. That's the that's the that's the part that's real. That's the part that is whole and complete. That's the part that's divine. That's the part that's present in all of us. And that's the part you're that's addressing such, when you say exactly. you don't you don't need fixing and so on. Exactly. So you're not dismissing the 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 possibility of some repair and healing and so on to the more relative phases of a person's well, structure. Actually, the funny thing is that when you embrace the truth of who you are at the deepest level, all of that happens automatically or by itself. Right. So what, what I'm saying is that remembering your divinity is a solution to every single issue that you believe that you have. Agreed. And not only is it the issue to every single issue that you believe you have, but it's also the issue to every global problem that we're currently experiencing too. Because in a world where you were fully embracing of who you were, I mean, you're not going to cut your own head off, are you? You, you? You'd realize very quickly that decapitating the head of another person is nothing more than chopping your own head off. Mm -hmm. Well, why would you do that? You wouldn't, you see? So there's an interesting paradox again that's playing out here, which is uh, this manipulation of fear. And we're seeing it now with Ebola too, right? There's so much fear around Ebola and it's just being propagated and it's being put out there in a major way um, and it's just constantly being drummed into the collective psyche that it's there that, and all of a sudden now it's airborne and it's just this manipulation of people that's playing out and it's a fear-based manipulation. And while you're in that energy of fear, you, you know this, the best that you can do is engage in that fight or flight mechanism, the part of the brain that's just rooted in survival. And so this is nothing more than just a, a, a veiled attempt to keep people trapped in survival and to keep people trapped in that animalistic state of being in which the only response is war or the only response is bombing or the only response is, you know, whatever the extreme response is. 
so that's why, again, this is important that we're awakening because we start to see through it all. We start to begin to um, search for a deeper truth in the midst of the um, misinformation that we're being fed on a daily basis. So do you think this misinformation is part of some kind of orchestrated conspiracy that is being puppeteered by, I don't know, the Illuminati or some such thing? Or do you think that it's just really kind of part of the collective consciousness that we, yeah. you know, we feed on this stuff and, and the, the media obliges because it sells airtime and, and ad space and so on, uh, but it's, it's not really being orchestrated by some, some uh, you know, powerful small group of individuals? You know, I, I, I haven't met them yet, so I can't confirm or I haven't I can't confirm or deny the existence of this small group of individuals. But what I can say is, if they exist, I'm sure I will meet them at some point, and uh, that will be an interesting meeting. Why do you think you would? Well, because it's a part of my purpose to eradicate all of that. That's hmm. kind of why I'm here. So if they are, if there really is a small group of people that are manipulating the majority, then that's a destined meeting, I'm sure, hmm. and uh, I'm sure it'll be an interesting one when it happens. Um, but ultimately, I think that the, 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 the key to freedom here is to address our own fears. And the key to freedom here is to, is to begin to recognize how we're engaging in life. Are we engaging in life from a fearful place? Or are we engaging in life from an open heartedness with a, a slightly more expanded awareness where we're more calm and more relaxed as we navigate our daily uh, activities? And actually, the more you begin to just breathe, stop, slow down and relax, the more you begin to disengage from those energies. And the more you disengage from those energies, the more you begin to see the bigger picture of what's really playing out out there. And, you know, is it is it some, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, David Icke jumps on that band. I mean, there's so many people that are on that bandwagon, right? That, Reptilians you know, and all that jazz. Yeah. And I, again, like, I'm, I'm the kind of person where I'm very skeptical. So unless it's happened to me or I've experienced it, I don't I don't buy into all the the, the, the ideas around it. So yeah. Um, so Illuminati, if you're out there, I look forward to meeting you at some point, <laughs> and uh, I can't wait to rid you of your controlling, fearful ways <laughs> by loving you, by hugging you. <laughs> yeah, um, it's interesting. Uh, well, you were pretty young when nine eleven happened, but um, I remember my yeah. reaction was just like. I'll be darned. It wasn't fear. It wasn't anything else. It was right. all this stuff happens. I mean, people want, I wonder why I can watch the news every night sometimes because, you know, how, how can you pollute yourself with all that horrible yeah. stuff that's going on? But I just kind of, it doesn't have any kind of effect, really. I, I, I don't think I'm numb yeah. or, or checked out. I think it's just that I, I do tend to reside in a more, you know, divine if you want to call it space and, and um all this Richie rick yeah and all this stuff just kind of seems like it's an it's a drama that's playing out uh, that's right and, and it's in, in a way it's fascinating like you go and see a, sh a shakespeare tragedy or something mm -hmm. and it's fascinating to see how the drama plays out and you know i i kind of feel like the tragedy is going to end up uh, happy in the end but um, it's, it's just kind of really interesting to see how the world goes through the changes it's going through and, and what is really the significance of these specific events that, are, that mm -hmm. freak everybody out. And again, I don't think you can see the thing is that when you start to really wake up, you can't look at them as just uh, isolated incidents. Yeah. You have to start putting them together. So I watch the news to spot trends. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a cosmic play unfolding. Yeah, because this Ebola thing has been playing out for, for how long now? And, and actually, the funny thing is, about a month ago, uh, the UN, when it kind of first came out, said that um, it has a potential to go airborne. Mm -hmm. And now, all of a sudden, the US media is saying it has a potential to go airborne, that they've underestimated it. Now, how much of this is true and how much of it is just manipulated, we don't know. But the viruses mutate and they, they sometimes can go airborne eventually exactly. when, they, when originally they can't. Yeah. But, but again, we have to navigate our fearful response to what's playing out because if mm -hmm. because it takes our consent. Now, right now, if, if everyone watching this news or in the Cibola thing buys into the worst case scenario and lends their energy to it, then it becomes a reality, hmm. which is exactly what they're trying to do. But if everyone, and that's not to say be ignorant or be oblivious to what's playing out. I'm not saying that either. I'm not no, saying, you hang know, on, hang on. So you're saying that they, whoever they are, are mm -hmm. actually trying to uh, bring about a, a worldwide pandemic? 
Well, look at look at look at how this is trending, right? And look at look at the amount of fear that's being propagated on a daily basis around Ebola. Pick a subject. It can be terrorism. It can be Ebola. Look at the amount of fear that is being propagated around these issues. Well, you have to have a look at why. Because if enough people get afraid, then clearly it becomes real. Mm. So who it would take, want it to become real? Well, any, and why? Any, any corporation. I mean, how much money would a pharmaceutical corporation stand to make off a cure off Ebola? Yeah, could be big. Right? And, and how profitable is war? So, yeah, I mean, you know, there are even some who say that the powers that be have this agenda of you know, diminishing the world's population to a fraction of its current numbers. Yeah, so I've heard that. I, I mean, I, I, I've, I've heard that they're trying to get rid of a billion people because they would, they've just decided that the world would be better in the absence of a billion people. Mm. Um, you know, but again, it's so hard to decipher what's real and what's true and what isn't, you know. That's why you just have to kind of trust your heart and just, you know, and again, look at what's going on. Don't look at things as isolated incidents. You know, start mapping things out. Then you can see trends. It's like you can see the end game before it happens if you do that. Yeah. Well, I think the, th the key thing to come back to is something you said a few minutes ago, which is uh, the divine or recourse to the divine is the ultimate solution to all this. Yeah. And, and we could also say in the same breath that recourse to the divine is the ultimate refuge. You know, if you can reside there, then mm -hmm. um, all this stuff will won't touch you you know be in the world but not of it that's right um you know and I, and I love what you said rick because like for the most part if you're resolved in who you are when you watch the news it won't impact you because it world events can illustrate where you're unresolved personally you see so when something's going on in the world if it impacts you then there's something you need to look at on a personal level that you haven't looked at right and that's the first thing so the, the news and the media actually becomes an evolutionary catalyst in and of itself, right? That's why I love, I love Russell Brand. Like Russell Brand right now started his own news uh, show called Trues, oh. where, where he aims to deliver the truth. Cool. I'd like to because, watch it. I'd like to get Russell he, on this show someday. Yeah, I'd love you to get Russell on the show too. Yeah. Everyone's got, every, actually everyone who thinks like I'm the avatar, they've got it confused. Russell's the, <laughs> Russell's the messiah. He's got the beard and the hair. Yeah. You know, he is. He's the incarnation yeah, you, you of Maitreya. <laughs> Russell Brand is the Maitreya. It is not Panache Desai. That is false information that Panache Desai is the Maitreya. Russell Brand is the Maitreya. There you go. I doubted him. <laughs> now he has no choice but to come on your show. Good. Um, so Russell, go Russell got so fed up with all the misinformation and all the fear that he basically just started his own, you know, little news channel on YouTube to tell the truth, right? And he doesn't do it in a way that... Um, you know, let's say a David Icke would do it or, you know, someone who's a conspiracy theorist would do it. But he does it in a way that's very rational and very logical and very funny because it's Russell. Yeah, well, put in a good word for me. Also, a good friend of mine is was his TM teacher. So, I'm, oh, yeah. Well, if you're in if you're in with this TM teacher, then you're in with this direct hotline to God. So you're, <laughs> you're in you're in a good place there, Rishi Rick. I'm sure that'll happen, brother. <laughs> OK, good. Um, so how did you end up on Oprah's radar? Well, um, she basically does a very good job of um, scouting out kind of who's next and paying attention to what's happening. And um, I was very fortunate and blessed that everyone that she was basically asking was saying that it was me. Hmm. And um, whether that be institutions that I'd been at or individuals that she respected and admired. And, you know, it's just a, a wonderful um, coming together, you know, that, that happened. And um you know, it was just a, a beautiful time that we shared, you know, that, that, that I will never forget and that I will always be grateful for because she is such an incredible being. And she has this ability to just expand everything in a way that is just so profound. And um, so I, I love her and uh, I'm, I'm so happy that we, we had the time that we had together. And, um, and uh, yeah, it's just an amazing experience in my life. Mm. You mentioned in your book that after you had been on your show, you, you, you got a little weird for a while. Like it, oh, yeah. it, went, it went to your head or something, or you got a little... Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was well, that? Because, because when you have that kind of light shone on you, something all that you're like... left with after that experience is your shadow. Mm, yeah. And also you realize how absolutely lonely and miserable success is. Right? All of a sudden I'm 34 years old and I've made it. I'm sitting on the couch next to Oprah Winfrey. Mm. That's something that some of my peers and colleagues have been trying to do for 20 years. 
And then, you know, and then two days later, I got my book deal, which was, you know, another with Penguin Random House. So it's like I had these series of highs that were just incredible. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, but then what you're left to deal with is yourself. Yeah. And the immature aspects of yourself and all the parts of you that are freaking out that all of this is happening. So the, I, was, I, was, I was ripped out of my comfort zone real quick. Kind of the Justin Bieber syndrome. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I, had, I, I kind of went a little Bieber. <laughs> right. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't punching out any paps or anything or, walk, or having this kind of compulsive need to walk around shirtless or have loud parties <laughs> or speed race a Lamborghini through the streets of Miami. But, but I had my own moment, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I'm so happy that I did because I could really, again, relate to what happens to people. You, you, you know, you go from whatever platform you've got to all of a sudden having a global platform and again, you have to mature in who you are to be able to maintain and sustain that. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you crash and burn. And we see it all the time with celebrities. You know, sure. people get there real quick overnight and all of a sudden they crash and they burn. You know, and, and um, I was so blessed in the fact that, you know, my daughters had been born in September. The, the, the uh, uh, interview aired in February and, um, you know, I was changing diapers and, and uh, taking out the trash. And there was this reality to my life that kept me, you know, really grounded. Mm. And um, I minimized my Justin Bieber moments, I'm, I'm happy to say. And um, thanks to some severe ass kickings from my wife and my mother, I was quickly right at the, uh, the course that I was on. And um, uh, I'll be forever grateful to, to them for that. Yeah, that's great. I can say the same of my wife and, and my mother. Oh, yeah. I remember one time I was walking in Switzerland with my mother and I yeah, I'd gotten kind of full of myself and she called me on it, you know, and, and uh, I, I remember that little lesson to this day. Um, and mm -hmm. my wife still does that on a regular basis. <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly count on the goddess to destroy me fully. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they do such a good job of, of playing that role, you know, they, they lovingly destroy everything that's false about me. Mm. And that's such an act of grace, you know, and, and um, I'm so grateful that that happens. And it happens around my kitchen table and uh, it happens frequently. And um, they have no problem letting me know how they feel. Yeah. And uh, they have no problem expressing their love to me because that's really what it is. It's just a, it's a major expression of love. But, you know, fame's a trip, man. And success is a, an even bigger trip. It's just an absolute illusion. And um, th there's not an ounce of anything real in any of it because people don't really know you. They know their perception of you. And um, in some ways that can be really painful because you can, you're can you never really yourself, right? And all of a sudden people's motivations change. You know, everyone's got an agenda. And, you know, I'm, I'm all of a sudden getting these tweets, can you introduce me to Oprah? You know, it's just, it's just weird, it's a weird world. And so so I'm glad I went through it, I'm glad I went through it early, I'm over it. And um, and uh, hopefully I've minimized any subsequent ass kickings from my mother and my, my wife as a result of addressing it at an early age. Minimize, but I wouldn't consider yourself absolved from oh, the no, possibility no. of some. <laughs> no, I, actually, life would life would not be as interesting as it is in the absence of those interactions. So, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm grateful. For it. One thing I found refreshing, I don't remember whether it was in your book or some of the interviews I heard I listened to, um, is that you know you readily acknowledge that you know you do um, you know vacillate between much more clear immersion in the divine and you know kind of a little bit off balance from time yeah. to time and then you have to come back to it so that there, there's an acknowledgement of a, a stabilization or an integration or a continual progress taking place mm -hmm. that that not all teachers would openly admit to well i'm only 36 you know so so there's still you know a maturing that's happening in me you know yeah, and, sure. uh, and i think that that's just important to be transparent about because you know, I, I think as it is, people create such a sense of separation between themselves and people like me falsely. And my job is to completely dispel that myth and that illusion to such a degree to where, you know, they're like, oh, cool, this is just normal. And it is. And so, you know, I have no problem putting it out there. And, um, and I think it's important because it gives people some real insight as to yes, it doesn't matter what state of consciousness you live in, you're always going to be human, you know, and that and that's and that's the blessing, you know, is that. Yeah. And I suspect you'll be able to say the same thing when you're my age, 65. You know, it's like, it's not a matter of age, because as long as you're alive, there's still some kind of growth taking place. 
Yeah, but when you're 65, you've seen you've seen more, you've experienced more, and, and you know it's like it's, you're you're less engaged in it. And we're just going to make this interview a lot cooler. So, um, I loved Scooby Doo as a kid. Did you watch Scooby Doo? Rick? I don't think Scooby Doo existed when I was a kid. You know, I was watching uh, Deputy Dog and uh, you know Mickey Mouse and that, that kind of stuff. So Scooby Doo is enlightened. And, and Scooby-Doo had a nephew called Scrappy, right? So Scrappy was this little puppy who was into everything, wanted to fight everything. He took everything personally. Like, he was the one who wanted to... So he's the small self, Scrappy. The big self is Scooby. Scooby's, like, so chilled out and so, like, not affected by everything. The best response you get out of him is just a, hmm, right? And it's like having an old dog. Like, when you've had a dog for 14 years or 16 years, that dog will just lay there and just look at you. And you can pull its ears... You can wag its tail, you can hug it, you can, you know, if you've got children, your children will dress it up with tutus and put, you know, tiaras on its head and paint its toenails, you know, so, and that dog will just sit there because it's seen and experienced everything. Mm. A puppy, on the other hand, is into everything. There's no way that that puppy's going to sit there. And so, so there's a certain age piece here. Mm. Also, the other thing for me is that you know, I've grown up in, in, the, in the public to a certain degree. I mean, everything that happened to me happened at a very young age. And it happened in a spiritual genre, right? So, hello, whoever that person is, walking behind Rick. That's my wife letting dogs in, which is hello. why, if you've seen me opening and closing the door over and over again during the interview, it's, I'm le letting dogs in and out. Thanks, thanks for clarifying that. I just thought you were bored and needed a moment, <laughs> needed a moment to open the door and have a quick chuckle and then come back to the interview. <laughs> So anyway, where was it? Yes. Scooby-Doo. So, Scooby-Doo, yeah. So Scooby-Doo is enlightenment. You know, I think with age comes this, comes this appreciation for life that you don't have when you're younger, where mm. you don't take things as personally. And, um, you know, one of the books, one of the chapters in the book is the spiral staircase, you know, the infinitely expansive spiral staircase patterns. You know, life impacts you differently at 70 than it did when you were 20. Yeah. Right? So, so hopefully when I'm 65, I will be as cool as you are. And, um, and as chilled out as you are, you know, and, and some of the more immature aspects of myself um, will have been embraced. Hmm. Well, if you got to know me better, you would not necessarily want to be. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, if I show up next week with a tiara on and my fingernails painted, you'll just know that I'm in my Scooby-Doo phase. Exactly. <laughs> Rick, Rick, Rick's getting a Scooby on. <laughs> right. Uh, so we'll wrap it up pretty soon. There's a couple of tidbits from your book that I just wanted to bring out because I thought they were beautiful. Um, one is that you said, page 149, either everything is divine or nothing is. And you talked yeah. about being grateful for whatever comes. And I, mm -hmm. I really like that. It really resonates with me. Thank you. You know, we, we have to cultivate an all-inclusive um, relationship with our reality. Mm -hmm. And the only way we can do that is by stop this incessant need that we have as human beings to compartmentalize everything, including God. Hmm. You know, at some point we just have to let God be infinite and deal and deal with the mystery of infinity and the ability to not know what it is, but to experience it. And so, you know, there's a lot of people who sit on, you know, their side of the fence as it pertains to God. And, you know, we even experience it, you know, in India where there's different gurus and different, if you have a different guru than someone else, you don't talk to each other. And, you know, someone's asana is better than someone else's asana. And, you know, someone's guru's disciples are the anointed chosen ones. And well, we have that in the West there. too. Every little Christian right? sect thinks exactly. it's the only one, you know. So it's like, it's, we have to just stop all of this immature tomfoolery mm. and just understand that we're all a part of this infinite spectrum. And we're just expressing this infinite spectrum in whatever way we have the faculty and ability to do. Yeah. Let me tell you an experience I have, uh, and it's part experience, part understanding, part intuition, but uh, it, it occupies my attention a lot of the time, which is that I just can't um, get over the fact that uh, as I'm walking down the street or doing anything, that, you know, I am really, what I'm actually looking at, interacting with, is just this ocean of intelligence assuming different forms. But even if we think of it from a scientific perspective, what science has told us about what's actually going on, uh, you know, every little cell in our fingertip, every little blade of grass, every insect, everything, uh, on a, if we were actually tuned into what, what's happening there, is this miraculous play and display of, of infinite intelligence. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no, there's no place in the universe, no cubic centimeter anywhere, which is 
not permeated with that intelligence. Of course, science doesn't usually talk about it in terms of intelligence, but but uh, this is just something which intrigues me, and I suspect that your experience of it is even richer, far richer than mine. And uh, you know, do you also kind of like dwell on that a little bit, or, or does it fascinate you? I do, but you know, it's kind of gone beyond. I used to have this need when everything first happened to understand it or mm -hmm. to articulate it, and. I've quickly realized that I just can't. Like the, the experience is so overwhelming that there are no words. It's just there. It's just this infinitely expansive energetic field that we are giving form to. So everyone's right in their belief that they're the center of their universe. They are. No matter where you are as an individual, you are in the center of the universe. And actually, you're providing your reality its content. So it's almost like this completely blank vibrational canvas that takes whatever form it takes because you're there observing it in whatever way you're observing it based on the degree to which you're integrated in yourself. Hmm. So that's the cool thing is that this whole thing is just one giant energetic loop of information that's, in, that's coming from us that's being then brought back to us you know, in a sensory way that we can then experience and then in some way try and articulate as best as we can using the very limited vernacular that we have. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it is. And, and again, like, you know, you and I will articulate it how we articulate it, but the truth is everyone's experiencing the same thing. They're just articulating it uniquely, but we're all experiencing it right now. Everyone is the center of their reality, every single person. And everyone's experiencing uh, what's going on uh, in their own unique way. Nice. Yeah, a friend of mine likes to use the phrase sense organs of the infinite. And I've, I've used it quite a bit yeah. myself that we're all like these little tendrils of, through, yeah. through which the infinite interacts with itself. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's really um, this whole thing about, you know, God incarnating as God to experience God really is what it's about. You know, just that's really the truth of it because. I'm just left in awe sometimes, just absolute awe of just the sheer light and brilliance that there is, you know, and, and also that what that encompasses and what that entails. I mean, that includes the guy who's about to behead someone, you know, in, in the Middle East. That includes the guy who's about to be beheaded. It also includes the knife that he's about to use to do the beheading. I mean, mm -hmm. it just and, and then it also includes the sand that they're standing on, the air that they're breathing. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just so all-encompassing and awe-inspiring that now I know why we as human beings have so romanticized it. Because it's, that's what we've needed to do in order to relate to it. Hmm. But in truth, it's completely unrelatable. And that's why, for the most part, it's so scary for people. Enlightenment, you know... It's living in your truth and living in your power or living in enlightened life is one of the scariest things for people because it's one giant unknown. It's one giant question mark. Until you actually do it. And then there's not then there's just a nothingness. Then it's not scary. Then there's just an absolute nothingness. Yeah. There's an Upanishad which says, uh, certainly all fear is born of duality. And, you know, so when duality has been transcended, then yeah. how can there be fear? That's right. It's another great one from Rick Vader. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a nice phrase. We could, we could maybe end on this one, although we don't have to, but this might be a nice one to end on. You said uh, on page 206, we're reaching a critical mass where the mm -hmm. energy of the collective will be love. Yes. That's exactly where we're headed. Mm. But basically, what happens when love enters your life, it, it begins to bring everything to alignment with that energy of love. What's happening right now on this planet is love is being introduced to such a degree or being remembered to such a degree that everything we once considered not to be love is actually becoming love itself. So it's like a, there's this unfinished equation that's being finished and balanced. And um, there's this giant harmonizing that's going on right now. And uh, everyone's basically coming into alignment with this greater, um, you know, chorus of love that's permeating the earth. So, um, yeah, it's it's awesome. And you know, it might be closer than we think. You were taking saying before three generations, and it maybe mm. maybe three generations to fully ripen. But um, 
like there's this there's this phrase in physics this concept called phase transition and mm -hmm. like when water gets hotter and hotter and hotter uh, nothing much seems to be happening. It could be 211 degrees Fahrenheit, and it seems like water. But as soon as it reaches 212, it boils. There's a phase transition. It becomes steam, and it's quite sudden and, and unanticipated if you didn't know the boiling temperature of water. So it could be, you know, I mean, look how fast things are changing with technology and, and yeah. this consciousness uh, uh, explosion that's taking place. So it seems to me, I hold out hope, that it could be that, um, you know, there will be... Uh, a transformation much more abruptly than yeah. than we might think. Well, it's like the, you know te the technological um, technological revolution was tens of years, and uh, you know the spiritual revolution will be just a moment. Hmm. Yeah, it's it just in in a singular moment, everyone will remember who they are. Could be. And my sense is that we're the generation that's going to bring that into being, and I use generation regardless of our age. Just just the fact that we're alive now, sure, those we're, in, we're inhabiting time and space. Mm -hmm. We're we're going to bring that into being. Yeah. Well, let's hope so, and let's keep on trucking and do it. Yay! <laughs> Amen, brother. Yeah. So, uh, so thanks. This has been really fun. Thank you. This yeah. has been a lot of fun. Yeah. It has been. It has been. Yeah. We'll have to do it again sometime. Maybe even would, in person somehow. I would love that. Yeah. That would be fantastic. So then let, let me make some wrap-up points. Um, I've been speaking with Panash Desai, as you no doubt know by now. <laughs> and uh, he, he has a website, panashdesai.com. I'll be linking to that from his page on batgap.com, as well as to the Amazon page at which you could get his book, if you wish, Discovering Your Soul Signature. And the, the book consists of 33 chapters, meant to be read over 33 days, and each chapter contains three segments, morning, noon, and night. So you read one in the morning when you get up, you read one at lunch, and you read one before you go to bed. And I didn't do it that way. I read the whole thing in the last week. <laughs> but um, I had to go to sleep a lot in the last week in order to read the <laughs> night one at the appropriate time. <laughs> but in any case, I enjoyed it. And uh, I will be... Uh, Linking, as I said, I'll, I'll link to Panache's website from mine and to his book. And if you go to batgap.com, you will see uh, several ways of looking at or exploring all the other interviews I've done and will do. Under the past interviews menu, they're, they're categorized three or four different ways, alphabetical, chronological, topical. And there's a future interviews men, uh, menu showing what's coming up. The next one will, next week I'll be going out to the Science and Non-Duality Conference in California and I'll be having a conversation with Adya Shanti and Francis Bennett about Adya's book, uh, Resurrecting Jesus. So that'll probably be the next one up on the site. There's a, to be notified when these things come online, there's a link on BatGap where you can sign up to be notified by email each time a new interview is posted, so do that if you like. Uh, there's a donate button, which I appreciate and depend upon people clicking from time to time. Uh, you'll see that on the right-hand side. If you don't like to do PayPal, there's a menu that says Why Donate, and it explains how you can do it in ways other than PayPal. And uh, there's also a link in each interview to an audio podcast on iTunes so that you can just subscribe to the audio and listen while you're commuting or something like that. So thanks for listening or watching, and thank you again, Panache. It's been great. Thank you, Rick, and thanks to all the back gappers out there for all of their love and support, and uh, I love you all. Thanks for loving me. You're welcome, and thank you. See you next week, everybody.